blessed to be here this morning. Let's open up in a word of prayer here today. And uh, let's see, uh, Brother Rich, if you would pray for us this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for bringing us to here together, Lord. We just ask that you be with us, Lord, and just be with the preaching of your word, Lord. Lord, we ask that you be if the country is torn apart, Lord, turn in different directions. And just be with the people that help bring the world back to you, Lord. And we just ask for your continued strength and be with the loss that you do with on a daily basis. Be with all those that are sick, Lord. You can bring your diet head down and take the tickets away. Lord, we thank you for the strength that we're able to come out here. Listen to your word, Lord. Amen. 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 seated here this morning. Let's go ahead and sing another hymn here today. Hymn number one. I'll hail the power of hymn number one this morning. Hymn number one.
Criminals? All right. Okay, so let's be in prayer for what's her name? Others here this morning. What you got, uh, Cameron? Others here this morning. Lily? Okay. All right. Anything else here this morning? Okay, quite a few here this morning. Jason? Uh, also, my dad is having a stand put in October 14th. Okay. All right. Any others here this morning? Go ahead. I think you had enough this morning already, Leanne. All right, let's go ahead and we'll we'll pray over these that are on the list here this morning. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Benny, Brother Buddy, if you would come on up this morning. We'll take our offering this morning, and then we'll pray over these that are on the list here today. And uh, Brother Benny, if you would pray for us today. I'll pray to the Father once again. Thank you, Brother. We have come before you, Lord, and with the Lord. Pertaining all your advice to me, I can't remember my name. Just name each need.
take out your Bibles here today, and uh, let's open them up. Open them up this morning to the book of Romans, chapter number 7 here this morning. Romans, chapter number 7. And there's a, a subject that I want to preach on here this morning. Not a very novel subject, probably one that all of us, uh, uh, definitely I think all of us recognize. But sometimes we, we may not recognize it enough. And that subject that I want to preach on here this morning is you are not perfect. And what we're going to see in the scripture is that, of course, uh, I think everybody in here understands that we are sinners. But believe it or not, there are those out there, false prophets, that teach a false doctrine, teaching that if you are saved, that you will be sinless and without sin in your life. And that is a false doctrine that is taught by men such as Paul Washer and some others that teach this false doctrine. This false doctrine. And so we're going to look at Romans chapter number 7 here this morning. And I want to show you that even the Apostle Paul, and when you think about somebody in the Scripture in the New Testament, that definitely served God with his life and did great things for God. In fact, even the Apostle Paul says about himself that he labored more than all the other apostles. <laughs> that he did more for the cause of Christ than all the other apostles is what the Apostle Paul said about himself. And yet he says this in Romans chapter number 7 about himself, that he is carnal, that he is a sinner, that he is not perfect. And so let's look at the scripture. Look at Romans chapter number 7. Look down at verse number 14. And the Bible says this, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, so under sin. Now first of all, let me draw your attention and what he says in verse number 14, I want to draw your attention to one word. That word is I. You see what the Apostle Paul says? And if you notice all throughout this portion of Scripture that we're going to read, he is continually saying, I, 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 talking about himself. Now, why do I say that this morning? Because those that teach that you can be sinlessly perfect, they'll try to change this portion of Scripture and they'll try to go to this portion of Scripture and say that the Apostle Paul was not talking about himself, but he was talking about the nation of Israel, or he was talking about those that are out there in the world, the lost, talking about anything else other than himself. Why? Because they want to change the Scripture because it does not match their doctrine. So look back at verse number 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. So what's he saying? Listen, Paul is a Christian, isn't he? He's a child of God. And the Bible teaches us that if we love God, then we ought to hate the things of the world. And so what is Paul saying? Hey, it's the things of the world. It's the flesh is what he hates. But yet he still does and is doing what he hates. So what is he saying? Basically, he's saying that he's not perfect. That even though he hates sin, he's still committing sin. That there are still things that he hates to do that he does not want to do. But yet because of his flesh, he is still doing those things in his life. And listen, I'm preaching this message this morning. As we talk about this this morning, I am not excusing sin whatsoever. But I want you to know this morning that I, as the pastor, do not expect people in the church to be perfect. What do I expect? I expect you to make an effort to live a righteous and a holy life. But listen, when somebody makes a mistake in their life, I'm not just going to automatically cut them off from the church. There's a process that we go through. And the Bible says that ye which are spiritual should restore such in one who is overtaken in a fault. So look back at the Bible there. Let's continue reading verse number 16. It says this. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now what does he mean that it's no more him? It's no more I that do it, but, do with it, but it's the sin that dwells within me that's doing it. What is he talking about? Well, because the Bible teaches us, and we'll see some scriptures on this here in a moment, the Bible teaches us that we have two natures. That because we are the children of God, we have this flesh that we were born into, and the flesh is still sinning. But the Bible tells us that we ought to put off the old man, talking about the flesh, and we ought to put on the new man who is renewed in Christ. 
And so what is he saying? It's not the new man that is sinning. It's not the spirit, but it's the body. It's the flesh that is committing sin. And so look back at the scripture, verse number uh, 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 17 there. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not, and I find not. So what do we see there? Paul says that within him dwells what? No good thing. And listen, as we talk about this this morning, we should not get so high-minded that when we look at other people, when we look at others that are committing sins, that we just get so high-minded that we're thinking too loftily about ourselves. No, because if it were not for the grace of God, every one of us would be a wicked, horrible sinner. We'd all be drunkards and drug addicts, and, and we'd be uh, fornicators and idolaters and adulterers, and we'd be in all kinds of sin if it were not for the grace of God. And if it were not for the Word of God, I would not have lived the kind of life that I have lived. Now listen, I can say this, that I have a pretty good testimony about my life. That I've lived a good life and that I've never gone and gone into the drugs and into alcohol and into those kinds of things. But listen, if it were not for God, I would not have lived that kind of life. And if it were not for the Word of God teaching me and leading me and guiding me, I would have fell. So it was nothing in and of myself that caused me to live that life. But rather, it was the power and the Word of God and the righteousness of Christ that enabled me to live that kind of life. And therefore, there is no glory in and of myself that I should be boasting or glorying of, of myself. But rather, my boasting should be of God. Look back at the Amen. scripture. Look at what the Bible says there in verse number 19. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. So it's pretty clear here. Is Paul telling us that he is committing sin? Pretty clear, isn't it? Look at verse number 20. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present within me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into, the cap bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So we see here in the scripture that Paul is telling us, even though he's a Christian, even though he's a child of God, he is still committing sin in his life. And listen, you will not, no matter how hard you try, you will not be sinlessly perfect until this flesh is taken away. And when is this flesh going to be taken away, by the way? Well, either when you die or at the rapture, you will lose this sinful flesh that you have. And until the rapture, we will not have a perfect body that is without a sin nature. And at that time, we'll be sinlessly perfect. But now, while we're walking around on this earth, living in this flesh, there is not a one of us, no matter how good we are, no matter how righteous we try to become, there's not a one of us that be, can become sinlessly perfect. Let me show you some scriptures this morning. Go to uh, John chapter number 6 and look at verse number 56. So turn, turn back to the left in your Bible. Uh, go to the book of John, John chapter number 6. And look down at verse number, actually look at verse number 53 when you get there. John chapter number 53 and verse, uh, John chapter 6 and verse number 53. And what do we see back in Romans chapter number 7? That it's not Paul who is, that enables him to live a righteous life. That if it were up to Paul, he's the one that would be doing sin. But the righteousness that he is able to do in his life is given to him by Jesus Christ. It is Christ that allows him to live a good and a holy and a righteous life. Not a sinlessly perfect life, but a good life. Look back at John chapter number 6 and look down at verse number 53. And the Bible says there, says this, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat, eat the flesh of the Son of Man, 
and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, notice this, does it say they will have eternal life or have? They have eternal life. That means they, they have it now. That when they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they have eternal life. And look at what it says. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he, shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So listen, who is it that gives to us eternal life? And who is it that enables us to live forever? It is none other than Jesus Christ. And we can go as far to say that it is only Jesus Christ that allows me in His righteousness to put on His robe of righteousness and to live a righteous and a holy life. Look back at the Bible, go to Ephesians chapter number 2. And look at what the scripture has to say there. And if you have been going soul winning at all for any length of time, you probably know what the context of Ephesians chapter number 2 is. Anybody remember what the context of that chapter is? Talking about salvation. Look back at it, Ephesians chapter number 2. And look at verse number uh, 1 there, Ephesians chapter number 2, and look at verse number 1, and the Bible says, And you hath he quickened who were dead, and trespasses and sins, when in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, and the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. What does the word quicken mean? The word quicken means to make alive, to be made alive. So what is the scripture saying? That even when we were dead in our sins, hath done what? He has made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And so what do I want to show you this morning? That it is only the righteousness of Christ that brings us our salvation. The Bible says that we were dead in our sins, in our trespasses. That we were living in sin. This is what the Apostle Paul was talking about in Romans chapter number 7. That we are dead in our sins and in our trespasses, but it is Christ that makes us alive, that allows us to be saved. And there is nothing that we can do in and of ourselves that will save us from our sins. And by the way, there is nothing in and of ourselves, our flesh, that will allow us to live a righteous and a godly and a holy <coughs> life. But it is only the righteousness of Christ, it is His Word, that will allow us to live that kind of life. The Bible says... Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way, but by the word of God. You want to live a righteous life? You want to do things that are right? You want to clean up your life? You want to change, uh, turn over a new leaf in your life? Then what do you need to do? Then you need to start putting the word of God within your life. And by the way, we saw in Sunday school that Christ, God says in his word, that he will reward every man according to his work. Then the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter number 9 that he that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, but he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Why is it that people today and Christians today cannot understand the word of God? You know why it is? Because they're sowing sparingly. They're not sowing bountifully. They're not pulling out the word of God. They may pull it out and they may read it for five minutes a day or less. Listen, you're not going to understand the deep things of the Word of God by doing that. Why? Because you're sowing sparingly. If you want to understand the deep things of the Word of God, then what do you need to do? Then you need to sow bountifully. You need to start pulling out the Word of God and studying the Word of God and reading the Word of God and taking it and applying it to your life. And only then will you begin to have the understanding of God's Word if you will dig into it. Look back at the Word of God. Let me show you some other scriptures. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and look at verse number 16. 
2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 16. So turn back to the left in your Bible and go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Look at verse number 16. The Bible says here in the scripture, it says, For which cause we faint not, but through our outward man, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For a light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and a, a, an eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So what do we see here in the Bible? The Bible tells us in verse number 16, that uh, it says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish. So what's it talking about? That the outward man, the flesh, the sinful man, the sinful man is going to perish. It's going to sin. It's going to make, make mistakes. We're going to fall. But it's the inward man, the Bible says, that is renewed day by day. Now, how do you renew the inward man? Anybody know? Well, what does Romans chapter number 12 tell us? Well, Romans chapter number 12 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and perfect will of God. How are you going to renew the inward man? How are you going to renew the mind? By first of all, living a righteous and a holy life and not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. But you see, the problem is, is that Christians today are conforming to the world. I saw something the other day, this Christian was a... Uh, making a post on Facebook, he was making a point that he was going to start. Uh, he was going to start boycotting the NFL. You know what? For what reason? Because of the whole situation with this quarterback that's not standing for the uh, the national anthem. Now listen, that man's not standing for the national anthem. But listen, way before the NFL condoned that, they were already condoning all kinds of sin. And listen, this is where you see where Christian scientists. Christian sight are not on the things of God, but it's on the things of the world. They want to boycott the NFL because this man's not standing for the NFL. But hey, let them live in their sin. Let them uh, parade out the cheerleaders out there in their skimpy outfits. Let them put Beyonce up there at the, uh, at the Super Bowl and do her dances and dress in, a, in an outfit that is, a, that is a, a replica of Satan and let her do all this wickedness. And let the NFL promote all this wickedness and that's okay, but it's not okay for a man to stand for the national anthem. You see where Christian sight has been taken off of the things of God and put on the things of the world? We have taken our sight and placed it onto the things of the world and we're being conformed to this world. And listen, what we need to do as Christians is turn off the television and allow ourselves to be changed and molded by the word of God. Look back at the scripture Go to Ephesians chapter number 4, and look at what the Bible has to say there about this. Look at Ephesians chapter number 4, and look at verse number 22. Ephesians chapter number 4, and verse number 22 this morning. By the way, all this that we're looking at here this morning is all introduction. The introduction is long this morning. The actual sermon is going to be short this morning. Look at Ephesians chapter number 4, and look at verse number 22. And the Bible says there, and the Bible says, Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So how is this new man created? Well, the Bible says he's created after whom? He's created yeah. after God. And he's created in, the Bible says, after God, in righteousness and true holiness. Look at verse number 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbors. For we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good. That he may have to give to him that he did. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, 
but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now listen, let me ask you a question here this morning. Because these false prophets out there teach that you can be sinlessly perfect. If you can be sinlessly perfect, would we need this portion of scripture? After we were saved, would the Bible have to tell us to put off the old man? And to put on the new man? And to not be living in the ways that we had lived before we were saved? Would we need those portions of Scripture? Hey, if we were sinlessly perfect, would we need the Scripture to tell us, Husbands, love your wives? If we were sinlessly perfect, would we need the Scripture to tell wives to be submissive unto their own husbands? If we were sinlessly perfect after we were saved, would we need the Scripture to tell children to be obedient to their parents? Listen, I got saved at five years old when I was just a young child. But I promise you, throughout my childhood, I got many spankings. You know why? Because after I got saved, I, that did not make me sinlessly perfect. And listen, you, you just look at all the children around here. Perfect example of how someone cannot, uh, that were not sinlessly perfect, are we? I mean, children are not sin, sinlessly perfect, are they? Getting them saved is not going to change if they still have that sin nature. You know what, last week, uh, if you were up here, I should have just recorded it sometime for you. So you can watch and see the things that are going on in the audience. I mean, look, last week Cameron was out there swinging around uh, some keys uh, keys last week. And uh, and sometimes you'll see uh, Levi over there playing with my wife's hair. Little children digging in their parents' uh, purses. And Levi over there sitting there massaging the back of his head with his foot. And children doing different things out there. The babies are making faces at one another. They're screaming. They're making noise in the service. Why are they doing that? Because they're not perfect. Because they are sinners. One over there sleeping on the pew right now. So what do we see here? That we are not all perfect. And our children are not going to be perfect just because they get saved. Listen, getting them saved is something that we should strive for. That they will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But listen, there's going to be a lot of work after that. And we need to understand as parents and as people of God that none of us are perfect. And we need to have compassion on one another. And the Bible says that we ought to be kind-hearted, uh, that we ought to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Why? Because we're not perfect. Do you think the Scripture would give us the commandment that we ought to forgive one another if we were all perfect and without sin? Would there be anything to forgive if we were all perfect? No, there wouldn't be anything to forgive, would there? But you see, the world has created this illusion that you have to be perfect, don't they? In fact, let me, let me just... Go to the book of 1 John. Let me uh, speed this up a little bit. Go to the book of 1 John. Let's look at some scripture there. This was a portion of scripture that when I was younger used to confuse me. Because I knew that I was saved. And I knew that I still had my sin nature. I knew that I did things that were wrong. But these false prophets will go to 1 John chapter number 3. And they'll twist the scripture to say, see if you are saved, you'll never sin. And look at 1 John chapter number 3. And look down at verse number 1, 1 John chapter number 3, and look at verse number 1. And the Bible says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Now listen, the scripture says if we have this hope, that we're going to be like him, that we're saved, that the man that has that hope, that he will do what? He'll work on purifying himself. Does it say that he's going to be perfect? No, it just says he's going to be continually trying to purify himself. Look at what verse number 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him, notice this, sinneth not. Now look at that. The Bible says if you abide in Christ, then you're not going to sin. Is that saying that if you're saved, you're not going to sin? No, because there's a difference between being saved and abiding in him. In fact, just go to a, back to the book of John. Keep your finger here in 1 John, because we'll come back to it maybe. But look at John chapter number 15, and look at verse number 7. 
And if you don't get there, I'll read it for you here this morning. John chapter number 15, verse number 7. And the Bible says this. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So what does it mean to abide in Christ? That if we are abiding in Christ, if we're spending time with Him, if we're putting His Word within us, if we're studying the Scriptures, if we're spending time in prayer with God, if we're walking in the Spirit, that then we will not commit sin. The Bible says if we live in the Spirit, remember the Bible said earlier that we've been made alive, we've been quickened together in Him, and that is what is called living in the Spirit. When you're saved, you've been made alive in the Spirit. But the Bible says if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And the Bible says that if we walk in the Spirit, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, how do you walk in the Spirit? Walking in the Spirit is reading the Word of God. Walking in the Spirit is spending time in prayer with God. Walking in the Spirit is speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That is all part of walking in the Spirit. That if we will be putting our mind on the Lord, and if, as the Scripture says, if we will commit our works unto the Lord, thy thoughts shall be established. And if we will do these things, then we will not sin. Because the Bible says, if you're walking in the Spirit, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now here's the problem. We're human beings, aren't we? And no matter how hard we try, all of us are going to have days when we get discouraged, when we get down, that we're not going to be walking in the Spirit, are we? Listen, I'll tell you right now, as the pastor of this church, and even having the knowledge of the Word of God that I have, that sometimes there are days that I'm not walking in the Spirit. And this is what the Apostle Paul was saying back in Romans chapter number 1, and chapter 7. That there are days that we're not going to be walking in the Spirit. And on those days we're going to slip, we're going to trip, we're going to fall, we're going to make mistakes. But here's the thing. The Scripture says in the book of Proverbs chapter number 16, I believe it is. No, Proverbs 24. It says this. For as a just man falleth seven times and riseth again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. So the Bible says, hey, the just man, he's going to fall. He's going to make mistakes, but what's going to take place in his life? He's going to continually rise up again. And he's going to continue getting back up and doing those things which are right and doing those things which are good. And so we get to the, to the content of the message here now this morning. What we need to realize about ourselves is that we're not perfect. And about those in our lives, that they're not perfect. You know, the world teaches us, it is the world and it is false prophets that will tell you, hey, you have to be perfect. And how did they do that? Well, the world, will first of all, will tell you, hey, your children need to be perfect. And if they're not perfect, if they're not listening up in school, then you need to take them and put them on Ritalin. They can't pay attention, so you need to put them on a drug. Listen, the Bible says, I already quoted it to you earlier, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. The Bible says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way, but by the word of God. And us as parents need to understand, you see, sometimes we get so angry when we're dealing with our children when they do things that are wrong, because we can't understand the foolishness, can we? We look at the children and we look at the things that they do, the foolish things that they do, and we think, why would you do that? It's foolish. It's stupid. It's ignorant. Here's the reason. Because they're a child. And because foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And we need to understand that our children are not perfect. And because they're not perfect, then we need to apply the rod of correction and we need to give them the Word of God and admonish them and nurture them in the Word of God. You know what I loved about my father when I was a child? I promise you I didn't love it at the time. I didn't love giving that rod of correction at the time. But as I got older, I think about the things that my dad would do when I was a child and he would apply that rod of correction when we needed it. But then you know what else he would do? He would sit us down after he, after he had spanked us, he would sit us down and he would pray with us. And he would tell us what we had done wrong. And tell us why it was wrong. You know what, maybe as parents, that's what we need to do. That after we apply the rod of correction, maybe then we need to take our child and sit them down and pray with them. And read to them a portion of scripture to show them why they did what was wrong is wrong. 
We need to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Listen, if you want your child to be able to focus in school, then what do you need to do? Then you need to teach that child to focus. I promise you, if you could see my four-year-old son in his school, you would think he's not learning a thing. When he's sitting there in front of his videos, we homeschool at home. And when he's sitting there, he's bouncing all over the place. He's humming, he's singing, he's doing other things. But listen, I promise you, he's learning some things. You'd be surprised at things that they pick up. Listen, just because your child at the age of four is not paying attention does not mean that they're not learning. And we need to understand as parents that they're not perfect. And if we want them to grow up, to be good, godly people, to be successful in their lives, then we need to invest in them. Then we need to work in them. You see, we can't be just lazy parents that sit back, sit back on the couches just watching our favorite TV show and watching the football and watching all these things that are on the television. We need to invest in our children. The world is full of parents that don't invest in their children. Look at our society today. A lot of homes, there's not even fathers in the home. And when there are fathers, they just sit on the couches doing nothing, not training their children. Look at the responsibility for training the children is the parents. It's not the schools. It's not the governments. It's not the churches. It's the parents' responsibility. What are some other ways that the world tries to get us to be perfect? Well, how about women? You know, the world puts out this image out there of the perfect woman, don't they? You will get the, the actors on the television and the supermodels that are on there. And they put this image out there of what the perfect woman is to look like. And listen, that woman that they show on television, they're always adulterers. They're always fornicators. They're whores. They are not real women. A real woman doesn't go around getting 20 different plastic surgeries a day. A real woman doesn't take a tapeworm and put it in her body to try to keep herself underweight. A real woman has to stay at home and has to work with her hands and has to take care of the children and is busy working at home and taking care of the children. And when the husband comes home, she's uh, maybe uh, going crazy. Why? Because she's at home taking care of the kids and her mind is going 20 different directions and all the things that she has going. That's a real woman. You want to see what a woman is supposed to be like? Well, read Proverbs chapter number 31. Because it says, A virtuous woman who can fight for her price is far above rubies. You want to see what a virtuous woman is like? Then read the book of Proverbs. Don't look at the world. You see, the world puts out this image of what the woman ought to look like. And listen, us as men, we need to realize that's not a real woman. That's not a godly woman. That's not a woman that we ought to be lusting after. And we need to understand that our wives are not perfect. And that love is a choice. You see, the world has created this image of this fantasy world that we live in. You know, we read these books and watch these, these shows and, and watch all these fairy tales. And, and the man and the woman, they fall in love together. And everything just goes perfectly right. And they live happily ever after. Listen, that's not re what real marriage is like, is it? Real marriage has bumps in the road. Real marriage, you're going, to have, you're going to make mistakes as the husband. Your wife is going to make mistakes as the wife. And as the mother of your children, you're going to make mistakes as the father. But listen, you don't fall in and out of love. Love is a choice. That's why the Bible commands us, husbands, love your wives. Amen. Because that is a choice that we make to love one another. But you see, the world has created this fantasy in which, hey, if your wife isn't perfect, well, then the perfect one is somewhere else for you. Isn't that what you see? The world says, hey, the perfect one is for you out there. Well, I'm not looking for the perfect one. I've got the simple one that God made for me, that he gave to me. And listen, it is my choice to love her and to keep her and to prop her up in my life and to help her and to lead her and to guide her just as it is, as it is her place. To help me and to give me advice and to be the wife that I need in my life. Why? Because I'm not perfect. And why you need to understand that your husbands aren't perfect. And listen, when he says that he'll get to that, that list that you have for him, you don't need to pester him. You know why? Because another year down the road, he's going to eventually get to it. Amen. Just going to jump for you. Eventually, he'll get to it a year down the road. But listen, we're not perfect. None of us are. Hey, your marriage isn't perfect. Your church isn't perfect. Your children aren't perfect. 
But it's the world that tells you, hey, if your life isn't perfect, then you need to go visit psychiatrist so-and-so. Hey, your marriage isn't perfect, you need to go visit psychiatrist. No, you know what you need to do? If your life's not perfect, then you need to take that which is perfect and put it within your life. Amen. Listen, this is the only thing that's perfect. This is the true Word of God. You want to have a better marriage? It's right here in the Word of God. You want to have better children? It's right here in the Word of God. You want to be able to live the kind of life that you need where you have peace and joy and hope and comfort? Then it's right here in the Word of God. And all you have to do is seek it out and search it out and put it within your lives. You know, the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter number 6, it says this, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... Ye which are spiritual, restore such in one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So we see that in the scripture, it tells us, hey, you're not perfect. And when another brother falls, that we, you see, this is what Christ was talking about, not judging, judge not, that you be not judged. He's talking about not judging in hypocrisy. And when another brother falls, we ought not be so quick just to, just to cut him off. But rather, we ought to restore him. And listen, it needs to go hold true the same in our marriages, in our lives, with our children, with our churches, with the brethren, that we restore such and one. When my wife makes a mistake, then what do I need to do as her husband? Then I need to help her. I need to guide her. I need to comfort her. I need to strengthen her up. You know why? Because she's not perfect. And myself as well. She should do the same for me. You know why? Because I'm not perfect. And listen, there's not a person in this church that is perfect. And that's why the Bible tells us that we ought to be kind one to another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Now, am I excusing sin this morning? No, I'm not excusing sin at all this morning at all. But what I'm saying is you help that man that's overtaken in the fault. Because none of us are perfect. We need to be strengthened and lifted up. And we need to understand that we are not perfect. Our children are not perfect. But the world, what do they want you to be? The world wants you to be perfect. And if you're not perfect, then they're going to prescribe all these different things for you to do. And they're just going to make it worse. I mean, how often do you see somebody out there in the world that they, uh, that they have a problem and, that, and the doctors will prescribe a drug for them? They go on to that drug and before long it just becomes worse and they can't afford that drug anymore. And now they have to go to the streets and they get hooked on heroin. Why? Because these doctors are evil and wicked. You know why? Because these doctors out there in the world, what they don't tell you is that if they can prescribe a long-term medicine, that they will get kickbacks off of that. That they get payments. They get paid for those things. Listen, we just need to take what the Word of God says. And the Bible says that if you know the truth, the truth shall make you free. The truth is right here. You want to be free from the things of the world? You see, you don't have to be in bondage to sin. You can obey the Word of God and it will free you from the things of the world. If you will put the Word of God within you, it will free you from those things. You want to have a better, better marriage this morning? It's right here. You need wisdom and guidance for leading your children, for raising your children? It's right here in the Word of God. And Amen. you need to understand, none of us are perfect. But our Father which is in heaven, He is perfect. Amen. And He's given us His perfect Word so that we might live a better, more holy, and righteous life. You see, I can live a good life. I can live a righteous life. I can live a holy life. Not a perfect one, but I can live a good one because it's the power of God that He has given to me. Let's end in a word of prayer this morning. We'll be dismissed this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for what You've shown us in Your Word this morning. Lord, I ask that You just lead us and guide us, that You would teach us Your Word, that You take it and apply it to our lives, Father. Father, I thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord. I ask that you would bless us, that you'd help us to just take this simple principle this morning, that we're not perfect, that we would apply these things to our lives and understand that people are not perfect, and that we have to forgive them, and that we need to help them and restore them back to, to fellowship, Father. Father, we thank you for what you've done for us. I ask that you be with us. We thank you for this food that you've given to us, and I ask that you bless it to our bodies. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed this morning.